Hebrews. The book of Hebrews is a bit of a daunting book to read. It's uh, difficult to study and to understand. The pictures in the book of Hebrews are from the Old Testament, much of them, and requires much study to thoroughly understand it. Although parts of Hebrews we're fairly familiar with, little verses here and there. Most of us are familiar with the verse that was read for us this morning. Without faith is it impossible to please God for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and he rewards those who diligently seek him. We Chances are we're familiar with that verse. We're probably familiar with the first verse in chapter 11, although we probably don't fully understand it. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Some gems from the book of Hebrews that inform our faith. The book of Hebrews, as we discovered a few weeks ago as we started this series, the book of Hebrews as a whole was written to encourage Jewish believers to persevere in their faith, to endure. To endure all kinds of hardship and perseverance and persecution. By the time the author of Hebrews gets to chapter 11, he recognizes that his readers have need for endurance and need to be encouraged to carry on. And so... In chapter 11, he embarks on the Faith Hall of Fame, and he brings up this great cloud of witnesses from the past to encourage us. And we're living in a completely different culture, in a completely different time and setting, but we too need to be encouraged. We too have need of endurance to live for Christ. And as we are reminded how magnificent and how awesome and how great our Savior is, we are encouraged. As we are reminded of how complete His work on the cross is, and how much He has secured for us in the spiritual realm, we become emboldened to live for Him, to live confidently and fearlessly, full of a living and a fruitful and an undaunted faith in these difficult days. Last time we talked a little bit about Abel and how he offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain. We talked about acceptable worship, humbly coming to God and giving him what he requires of us. We learned how Abel was commended and accepted for his faith for his faithful worship. The next character in the in the Faith Hall of Fame is Enoch. And how by faith he lived confidently in God's presence. In Genesis we read that he walked with God. And twice it repeats that in that passage we read this morning. He walked with God. He was he was in God's presence. It's a a description of his life. We, we read that he, he was accepted because he walked with God by faith. We read that he did not taste the bitter separation of death. He was transferred, he was taken to be with God, to be in his very presence, not restricted by the limitations of his physical body, but fully enjoying God's favor and his blessing in his presence. The purpose of these examples of faith is, as we've said, is to call us to draw near to God, to come close, to live in his presence, to live by faith in what Christ has done on the cross, to live confidently in God's presence. And that's what walked with God, that phrase really means. 
the metaphor that this speaks to Enoch's ongoing and continual intimacy with God. Apparently Enoch had a very close relationship with God over his 365 years on earth. And then one day his life took an unexpected turn. And he bypassed physical death, going directly to being God's immediate presence. The writer of Genesis really doesn't elaborate on this at all, and neither does the writer of Hebrews. But in Hebrews we find the why. Because of Enoch's faith, God commended him, declared him to be acceptable, and then he took him to be with himself. I think we can learn a couple of things from Enoch's life of faith. One of them not being, okay, this is what we're not supposed to learn, that if we have enough faith, we don't have to die. Okay? It's, we're we're going to die, probably. <laughs> it's not like if you have enough faith, you don't die. Well, that only happened to two people that we know of, Elijah and Enoch. And I don't think that's the point of the point of the passage at all. Point is faith. Point is, a couple of things we can learn is that we can please God by faith. And we can walk with God. We can have a close, personal, intimate relationship with Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. This, probably, if you've been in church before, if you've been brought up in the church, this might sound really, really basic and really simple and not profound at all. Of course we can please God. Of course we can walk with Him. That's what we're supposed to do. Of course we can have a relationship with Him. This isn't new to us. In our heads, intellectually, we agree with this. Yes, we can please God. Yes, we can walk with Him. We don't doubt that it's possible. We don't doubt that it can happen. We read the Psalms. And the Psalms urge us to live closely in God's presence, to be in His presence. Psalms 95 says, Let us come into His presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to Him with songs of praise, for the Lord is a great God and a great King above all kings. Psalm 100 declares, Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth, serve the Lord with gladness, come into his presence with singing, knowing that the Lord, he is God, it is he who has made us and we are his. We look back and when the Israelites were on that journey through the desert, God was teaching them that they were his people and he was their God. He, he showed them that his presence was with them. They had the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. And when they built the tabernacle, the very presence of God dwelt between the cherubim on the lid of the mercy seat, on the Ark of the Covenant in the most holy place, the light in an otherwise dark room, an inkling of the light that was to come. We know now, we experience now the presence of the Lord, those of us who are His, we experience his presence as the Holy Spirit indwells us, marking us, identifying us as his own. What saints before the cross could only see by faith, we have the privilege of experience, of knowing, of living. We have the privilege, the blessing of knowing the presence of the Lord. God with us. Emmanuel. Paul writes, the very curious phrase, Christ, who is our life. It is true. Do we know it? Do we live in his presence? What before the cross was only seen through eyes of faith, has now become a reality. We on this side of the cross, living on, living in the reality of the presence of God. 
Are we living confidently in his presence? Experiencing the closeness of unbroken, unfettered relationship with our Savior. We know it intellectually that it's possible. We, we agree with it, yes. We can walk closely with God. Yes, we can experience his pleasure. Yes, we can please him. Yes, we can walk with him. We don't argue with that necessarily. The question for us this morning might go something like this. Are you walking with him today? In close fellowship? Step by step? With your Savior? Are you experiencing this? Are you living it out? Can it be said of you? He walked with God. Is God pleased with you today? Do you experience his pleasure? I smiled when Ross said, What's your week been like? <laughs> That's always interesting, isn't it? When somebody asks us that in church, they get a qualified answer, don't they? Usually fine, which doesn't mean anything at all, or great, which doesn't mean anything either. What's your week been like? Have you been living confidently in God's presence, experiencing his favor, experiencing his nearness, his pleasure this week? If I had to hazard a guess, I'd venture to say that the majority of us here this morning have had a week with God that resembles a week in the life of many married couples. We're nowhere married, but I haven't really thought a lot about it this week. I know I'm married, but I really haven't got a clue what my other half is thinking or feeling. <laughs> Ouch. Perhaps your week with God has been amazing. And you just have some stories to tell of his experience, of experience with him, uh, experience his presence, his joy, his power. If that's the case, I rejoice with you. Sometimes my weeks are like that. If that's been your week, I just encourage you to continue living confidently in God's presence. And the rest of us... <laughs> Why is this? Why is this? Why are we prone to wander? Why are we prone to wander from close fellowship with the Lord? Why are we so often lukewarm? Neither cold nor hot in our relationship with God. Why is it so difficult to live in his presence? in his joy, in his pleasure, walking confidently with him. What hinders us from walking with God as he not did? This week, ironically, was a good week for me to be studying this topic and thinking through it and praying through these verses of Scripture. Like many of you this week, there was more more to do than there was time to do it. I'm still recuperating after pushing fairly hard during the renovation of the mass. I knew it was going to be, I knew May was going to be a little tough, but yeah, I was right. I'm still tired and sore and stuff. Renee probably will testify that I've been a little grumpy at times. This week, to me, this week we had some unexpected vehicle things. Many of you probably had unexpected equipment things. As Ross alluded to, I had the wonderful surprise Friday night as I was out at my brother's place celebrating his 51st birthday with my family out there in Youngstown. I got a call. We have sewer in the basement. Oh, what a delight. <clears throat> and uh, just 
I knew the building inspector was coming to do the final at the mass this week, and then I was kind of, okay, I just hope that goes good, because I don't want to fix anything at this point. <laughs> that was an interesting mix, eh? Difficult things. But there's some good things. We ha- I look back at the week and had some wonderful people time. A uh, couple of birthday celebrations with Re- we had with Renee's family. A great evening with them. A great evening with my family out in Youngstown. Tuesday, I got to spend the day in Three Hills at Prairie with about 15 or so other rural pastors. Just had some great conversation, encouragement there. Um, had a great morning conversation for a couple hours with a husband and wife who are just really intent on being disciples. How can we do this better? So like many of you, my week has been a mix of kind of the good, bad, and the ugly. And uh, I have to ask myself, as we consider the life of Enoch here, are we living confidently in God's presence? Are we walking closely with God? What does that look like? I think we kind of know what it's like to walk close with God, to feel His presence, to be doing what we're supposed to be doing, to make making those decisions that we should be making, to choosing Him above all else. We kind of know what that's like. Chances are some many of us, probably all of us, have been that close to the Lord at some time or other. But can it be said of our life, like like Enoch, he walked with God. He walked with God. As I was thinking about this, my mind went to, what are the things that stop us? What are the things that hinder us? And as I was putting the final touches on my sermon last night, the song that was running through my head was the one that's on the radio with Shine. It's like, you got chains, you need a chain breaker. Something like that. We're going to play it at the end for a closing song. And so I thought, we have chains that stop us from living in God's presence. We have chains that bind us, that hold us back, and we need a chain breaker. So we have a small chain breaker, and I won't try and cut that chain with it. I was hoping like for a four-footer, but that's all I could get my hands on this morning. <clears throat> what are the chains that hold us back and bind us and take us prisoner, captive, What are the chains that stop us from living confidently in God's presence? I could exhort you and encourage you and challenge you for half an hour of what it's like to walk in God's presence, but I think we kind of know. And I think in our heart of hearts we want that. Otherwise you wouldn't be here this morning probably. But there's these things that hinder us. There's these chains that have a grip on us and they stop us. They hold us captive from walking with God. Living confidently in His presence. What are the chains? So I I, I thought of three chains that hinder us from living confidently in God's presence. The first chain that keeps us from entering into a confident life of fellowship with God is that bright, shiny chain of distraction. Distraction. We get distracted from the important things in life lots of times by the urgent things, don't we? We get distracted from the important things by the things that are going to pay off right away, by immediate gratification. We get distracted from living confidently in God's presence by the next new thing, 
by bright shiny things that distract us you know the evil one is always on the prowl ready to tempt us away to entice us away from doing what we're supposed to be doing from being where we're supposed to be and being with who we're supposed to be with he's ready to tempt us with something attractive that will lure us away from close fellowship and intimacy with God. I think one of the devil's most commonly overlooked tools may be this bright, shiny chain of distraction. I think today, with the advent over the last ten years probably, of personal digital devices like our phones, it's easier for us than ever to be distracted and amused and entertained how has your phone changed you? can you leave it alone? is it a distraction? is your computer, is the internet a distraction? it can be helpful, sure but is it a distraction? do we go here when we should go to the cross. It's easier for us to be distracted, to be amused, to be entertained when we should really be focused, when we should be learning and enjoying the presence of our good, good Father, of our God. You see, we get distracted. And then our fellowship with God cools. And the devil wins. I think one of the things that keeps us from living confidently in God's presence is the bright, shiny chain of distraction. I think another chain that holds us captive from living confidently in God's presence is the big, thick, rusty chain of fear. Fear. Fear of missing something. Fear of offending someone. Fear of facing ourselves, who we really are. Fear of God himself. I suspect, though, that fear comes to us in disguise. we're reluctant to be in God's presence maybe it's because we have a fear that we're going to have to actually deal with this besetting sin that has been dogging us all of our days maybe maybe we're afraid that we're going to have to yield finally totally and completely to God and, and we don't know what he's going to do we're just afraid of that maybe we're afraid of letting go of some sin or some something that keeps us from enjoying God's presence in our life it's been part of us for so long this, this sin, this attitude, this thought pattern has been part of us for so long it defines us. And we don't want to let it go. Because we're afraid. We're afraid. We don't, don't know how to live without this thing. We're afraid to face ourselves. Maybe we're afraid of change. Maybe we're afraid of being out of our comfort zone. If we let it, fear is pervasive. It's chameleon-like. Disguising itself and fear often slowly, almost indiscernibly, 
tightens its grip on us until we're rendered almost useless for the work of the kingdom. The big, rusty, thick chain of fear slowly winds itself around us until we're captive. And we can't do the work that God's got prepared already for us to do. The big chain of fear can hinder us from living confidently in God's presence. Fear. Distraction and fear. The third chain I think that holds us back and holds us captive from living confidently in God's presence, from enjoying Him and the rewards of knowing Him. I think the third chain is pride. Pride like fear comes with many different faces. Pride sometimes is disguised as busyness. Just busy. Got stuff to do. Don't have enough time. Too many things to do. Could be I'm not really wired like that. I'm just not a real spiritual kind of guy. Pride can come as a reluctance to yield control. Because I want to be in control. I know what's best for me. I'm the master of my own destiny. I sail my own ship. Kind of do things my way. Thinking too highly of ourselves. Thinking that we're self-reliant. Self-important. Pride can be disguised in many things. Pride can often keep us from asking forgiveness or extending forgiveness, seeking reconciliation, righting a wrong. Pride can keep us from asking for help and dealing with a particular besetting sin, and we've all got at least one. Pride can prevent us from being vulnerable to someone close to us. Pride can prevent a a relationship, perhaps a marriage, from being all that it could be. And I ask myself, why is it so difficult to pray with my wife? I mean, I like her. And she's a pretty great gal. I trust her with my life. Why is it so hard for me to pray with her every night? Why is it a struggle? Because when we pray, guys... We're vulnerable. We say, we don't have the answers. (laughs) We don't know what to do here. That's why we're going to God. That's a pride thing. We keep being reminded of that. Pride can be this chain that holds us back from living confidently in a close, intimate relationship with God. If the If the chains of distraction, the chain of fear, the chain of pride are holding us captive from entering a life of confident living in God's presence, we need presence, we need some chain breakers. We need something to break these chains to free us to enjoy the fullness and the joy that come from living confidently in the presence of Almighty God. The first chain breaker that I think we need to lay our hands on and to use often and with much vigor is the powerful chain breaker of delight. Chain breaker of delight will render the chain of distraction powerless. Psalm 37 reads, Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to him, trust in him and he will act. Delight yourself in the Lord. That makes that means that He's the one we want. He's the one that we find delight in, that we find joy in, that we find what brings us joy and fulfillment. And as we delight ourselves in the Lord, everything else fades away. No longer are we distracted. For our attention is held 
by the one our delight is in. Interesting. As we delight in the Lord, he becomes the desire of our heart. And so it is true. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. What he's saying is, you delight in me, I will give you me. You, we're going to be close, we're going to be tight, you're going to walk with me, says the Lord. The most excellent thing is that as we delight in the goodness and mercy and love of God, the things that we most desire have to do with Him. Knowing Him, serving Him, worshiping Him, loving Him. Delight in the Lord breaks the chain that bright shiny chain of distraction and it frees us to live confidently in God's presence knowing his pleasure and his favor we need to break out the chain breaker of delight and use it to break the chain of distraction another most powerful chain breaker is love the love of God this isn't how much we love God, but it's recognizing and acknowledging and living in the fact of his love for us. John knew this. And he writes, perfect love casts out fear. And he says, see what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called the children of God. Isn't this amazing? What kind of love is this? It's amazing love is what it is. The love of God is what breaks the chains of fear that hold us captive from living confidently in his presence. When we realize and when, he, when we accept God's love for us, we're able to conquer fear in all its disguises. Come to our Heavenly Father confidently as a child comes to his Father with arms open and eyes filled with trust, confident in the goodness and the strength the love of his father as we grow in our acceptance and understanding of the love of God for us we grow in confidence for, there, for where there is love there is no fear perfect love casts out fear we grow in confidence and fear has got to go got to flee as we take captive our own thoughts of doubt and anxiety and fear as we step out in faith beyond our comfort zone, beyond our own capability into the faith zone, the zone where faith leads the way with confidence, seeing what we cannot see and knowing what we cannot know, being confident in the one who will complete what he started. Knowing and accepting the love of God is probably the most powerful chain breaker that we can lay our hands on. Lose yourself in his love and fear will have no place. The chain breaker of love breaks the thick, rusty, strong chain of fear that so easily binds us and holds us captive. The love of God. And we need a chain breaker that's going to break the chain of pride. The chain breaker that shatters the chains of pride is the chain breaker of humility. The prophet Micah writes, He has told you, old man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. The prophet brings a powerful image of walking humbly with God as one of the things that God requires of those who follow him. To walk humbly with God is to follow the steps of Jesus. As he yielded his will to the fathers, as he came to earth as a man and he lived and he died on the cross and he rose again on the third day victorious over sin and death and hell. Paul writes about this in Philippians 2. A magnificent description of the humility of Christ and he says, and so you have this same attitude that was in Christ Jesus. Humility is saying yes to God, whatever the cost. 
Humility is saying yes to God, whatever the question. Humility is saying yes to God before there is a question. Before there is a request. Before there is a demand. Humility is yielding our will to His. Praying the prayer that Jesus prayed in the garden. Not my will, but yours be done. Humility is praying the prayer that Jesus taught us. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The powerful chain breaker of humility sets us free from besetting sins. Frees us from all that pride would bind us to. Humility opens the door wide open for forgiveness, for reconciliation. Opens the door for relationship, for powerful living that points clearly and confidently and compellingly to Christ who is our model of humility you see Christ is the ultimate chain breaker he, he's broken the chains of sin death and hell and he set the captive free that's what he came for Christ breaks the chains of sin and self to bring the sinner into a close and confident and power, powerful life in his presence What closer presence to God can we think of or imagine than having the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, within us as our life? This is something that the saints of old could only imagine. To have the life of Christ within you. To be given a new heart, a heart of adoption, This is something that the saints of old could only look forward to. But at the cross, Jesus made the way for it to become reality. You see, we don't have to go anywhere to live in God's presence. He is with us. God with you. He says, I will never, ever, ever leave you nor forsake you I am with you always even to the ends of the earth go be disciples it is possible to live confidently closely intimately in God's presence and so this morning we ask ourselves have you got chains that hinder you from living confidently in God's presence? Are there chains of distraction? Chains of fear? Or chains of pride? What's keeping you from delighting and enjoying your Savior? What's keeping you from saying with the psalmist, you make known to me the path of life in your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. What's, what's keeping us back? Have you got chains that wrap around you, that hold you back, that hinder you, that hold you captive? If you've got chains, you need a chain breaker. You need the chain breaker of delight in the Lord. We need the chain breaker of accepting the love of God. And we need the chain breaker of living with the humility of Christ. We need the ultimate chain breaker. And his name is Jesus. Would you pray with me? Father, we do thank you this morning.